my colleague, James Ishmael Ford, who holds dual ordination as a Unitarian Universalist minister and Zen Buddhist priest, once wrote a book called, If You're Lucky, Your Heart Will Break. It was not a bestseller. <laughs> it's funny, if you look at self-help books that are successful, it's habits of highly successful people, or how to win friends and influence people. Not a book that promises us heartbreak. But the thing that's so striking to me about his book is this. Throughout the book, he refers to his own spiritual awakening. He talks about his spiritual awakening. And the image he uses most often to describe this awakening is the image of a breaking heart. He'll talk about an insight, and he'll say, that was when my heart broke. Or sometimes, that was when my heart broke open. But every image that he has of growth is also an image of a broken heart. My sermon this morning isn't really about Zen Buddhism. That's probably for the better. God knows I'm not particularly skilled at Zazen sitting. And I lack any kind of great profound insight about koan contemplation. But what this sermon is about is about this curious linking of heartbreak and spiritual growth. This idea that if you're lucky, your heart will break. I think it's such a striking idea, because if you were to ask most people why they engage in spiritual practice, why they join a religious community, I would believe that most people would not say, oh, I'm hoping to have my heart broken. I've never met anyone who's walked through the door here for the first time and said, I'm looking for a church where my heart can break. Some of us came to church because our heart had been broken by the death of someone we loved, by a relationship that had not worked out, as we had hoped, by illness and addiction, by events in the larger world that troubled us. And we came to this place looking for a place where we could work on and work through and work to mend our own broken hearts. We came looking for a community that would hold us through it and help us through it and maybe be an agent of our healing. But heartbreak is not what anyone thought they were signing up for when they signed the membership book. What are the fruits of a spiritual life? I mean that when you engage in a spiritual life, what are the results? What happens to us when we engage in religious and spiritual pursuits? What changes take place within us? I think that we often imagine that the fruits of spiritual engagement will be things like peace, like gratitude, perhaps joy, perhaps tranquility or equanimity or balance. We imagine the fruits will be things like connection, some of us imagine that the spiritual life will lead us to an experience of unity or oneness. Like that old joke, what did the Buddhist say to the hot dog vendor? Make me one with everything? <laughs> so the hot dog vendor says, here's your hot dog, I'll give you $4. The Buddhist hands him a ten, and the vendor does nothing, and, and the Buddhist says, where's my change? And the vendor says, well, doesn't change come from within? <laughs> That's not what the sermon is about. <laughs> but we imagine... We imagine that the fruits of the spiritual or religious life will be positive. St. Paul wrote in Galatians that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
Who could argue with that? Even religious traditions with which we disagree theologically tend to make claims that the fruits of the spiritual life will be pleasant and pleasurable. There is right now receiving much attention an influential strain of evangelical Christianity known as the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel teaches that God's plan for us is for us to become wealthy and that God favors or has given a blessing to the wealthy. It's a deeply problematic theology. I consider it, in fact, to be a perversion of the Christian message. And the prosperity gospel is another form of belief that the impact of spirituality and religion in our lives will feel good. And that's why the title of the book and Ford's description of spiritual awakening is so challenging. It's promised that if you're lucky, your heart will break. In Buddhism, the central story of religious awakening begins with heartbreak. According to the legend, there was once a prince. The prince was raised in a palace surrounded by walled gardens. His parents raised the prince with no exposure to anything sad or painful or unpleasant. No expense was ever spared in providing him with the best food, the finest entertainment, and every pleasure imaginable. His life was like living in an all-inclusive resort. I've never actually been to an all-inclusive resort, but that's what I imagine the prince's life was like. Until the day the prince decides to explore beyond the palace walls. We learn in the story that he takes three journeys. On the first journey, he encounters someone whose body is racked by the pain of illness. On the second journey, he encounters someone whose, whose body is crippled with old age. And then finally, on the third journey, he encounters a funeral procession carrying the body of someone who has died. A funeral procession followed by mourners. And for the prince, it is this encounter with pain and suffering and loss and heartbreak that causes him to renounce the privileges of royal life and propels him on a spiritual journey that results eventually in enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. And in the story of the Buddha, this awakening is treated as a good thing. Heartbreak is not only the very thing that sets him on the spiritual path, the broken heart lies at the very center of, is foundational to religious experience. In popular psychology and popular spirituality, the contemporary writer who comes, I think, the closest to embodying this idea of heartbreak, this idea that heartbreak is a part of the spiritual journey, is Brene Brown. Brown's research and scholarship focuses on what she calls wholeheartedness. But the path, the path to wholeheartedness, involves vulnerability, owning our mistakes, facing our own shame, confronting our own broken hearts. In one of Brene Brown's newer books, she offers what she calls a manifesto of the brave and brokenhearted. I want to read the full manifesto, because I, found that I find it so powerful. So here it is, the manifesto of the brave and brokenhearted. She writes, there is no greater threat to the critics, the cynics, and fear mongers than those of us who are willing to fall because we have learned how to rise. With skinned knees and bruised hearts, we choose owning our stories of struggle over hiding, over hustling, over pretending. When we deny our stories, they define us. When we run from struggle, we are never free. So we turn toward truth and look it in the eye. We will not be characters in our stories, not villains, not victims, not even heroes. 
Instead, we are the authors of our lives, writing our own daring endings. We craft love from heartbreak, compassion from shame, grace from disappointment, courage from failure. Showing up is our power, story our way home, truth our song, we are the brave and brokenhearted, we are rising strong. Manifesto of the brave and brokenhearted. Brene Brown, when she was on Krista Tippett's program on being, said this, and I find this just profound. She says, as a researcher, with 11,000 pieces of data, I cannot find a single example of courage, not moral courage, not spiritual courage, not leadership courage, not relational courage. I cannot find a single example of courage that was not born completely of vulnerability. And so when we buy into a mythology about vulnerability being weakness or gullibility or frailty, that's often a way for us to give ourselves permission not to be courageous. Isn't that something? Every act of courage she's ever encountered is an act born of vulnerability. Many of you don't, don't know this, but um, I first became interested in Brene Brown um, in my last congregation when I had a half dozen parishioners over the course of a few weeks come and send me her TED Talk, her original TED Talk on vulnerability. And, um, and I read it, and it was, so, it was so good that I decided I would preach on it. And so I preached I preached on it, and I had a lot of people after the service tell me, oh, that's a, that was a good sermon. And then, like a few weeks later, there was a call for um, ministers to submit sermons they had given on vulnerability. There was like a, a contest, and, and I decided, oh, I, I preached this sermon. So I, and so I sent my sermon off, and my sermon was selected to be published. And I was very proud of that. And then it was published, and they said, we want to include in this collection voices from people who struggle with vulnerability. That's, that's, I thought that, that, people laughed at the first service like that. Because <laughs> here I was thinking it was, but it was, um, I feel like something got lost in translation there. Any, anyhow, anyhow, but, but here, was, here was the thing, is that, is that it actually was kind of what, um, what, I, what I learned about, what I, what I agonized about in, in that is kind of how to preach and how to, to face a way in which the things that I'm, the things that scare me and the things that keep me up at night and the things, you know, that the, when, when I shield myself from wanting to be vulnerable, that it is actually true, it is actually true that I have grown the most in my life when stepping into the things that challenge me, and stepping into the things that are uncomfortable. If you're lucky, your heart will break. There is Another side to this, I would be remiss in this sermon not to bring up, not to mention authors, theological authors, who critique the idea that suffering is good for us. They point out, and I think rightly, that the belief that, that suffering is good for us often uh, is too often used to excuse or approve or sort of not challenge suffering in the world. And they point out as well that there is a, there is a, there is a problem with saying that, that suffering is good, that everybody has the, the right to author their own story. 
And so I want to hold that, I want to hold that position. But I also want to hold the other position. The one that says the breaking of our hearts. The breaking of our hearts will be a path towards growth. I think authentic spirituality leads us into places where there is suffering, helps us not to avert our eyes, to hold compassion and listening and understanding for suffering. Authentic spirituality leads us into an honest engagement with the suffering of the world. When has your heart broken? James Ishmael Ford refers to this breaking of the heart as discovering a terrible holiness. What a profound image that is. And so I leave you this morning. I leave you this morning with the thought that the breaking of our hearts the breaking of our hearts may be a path towards our own growth, our own learning, our own emerging. Whatever your journey, amen, and blessed be. And we'll close today with the singing of our closing hymn of the morning. It's number 18. It is a spiritual hymn, What Wondrous Love Is This? And I invite you to rise in body or in spirit.